extraordinary thing about Leonardo da Vinci is he wasn't just any genius. He was a genius at science and a genius at art, which doesn't seem possible. Because at my school, like most schools, every class had one brainy kid who knew all the answers in science. Magnesium sulfate, sir. And they'd always have a little extra bit. Unless, of course, it's been exposed to freezing nitrogen. And these kids were useless at art. And then every class had a kid who swore at teachers, a skinny kid who was brilliant at climbing, a kid who stank, a compulsive liar who'd say things like, my brother runs a space station, and a kid who only came in once a week and the rest of the time trained greyhounds for his uncle, and sometimes he'd sit at the back of the class with a crossbow. That was the kid who was brilliant at art. Whereas the greatest work of art that most of us in the class ever achieved was to scrawl, Michael is a tosser, with tosser spelt wrong. But Leonardo da Vinci would also have been top of the class in maths, geology, music, grave robbing and designing tanks. And he displayed a common characteristic of genius in that he hardly ever finished anything that he set out to do. Leonardo was born in 1452 in the small town of Anciano in the region of Vinci, hence Leonardo da Vinci, in case anyone was thinking, oh, that's a coincidence... Now, despite the claims that he was born in this house, no-one knows exactly where it was. Though, if they hear us say that, they'll probably send someone out to go, No, 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 I remember. I see him run around here, a small boy, riding bike, that he invented. From the age of about five, he lived with his father. And he had no formal education, partly because he didn't come from an elite family. And when he was a teenager, he and his father came to live in Florence, a city-state of 70,000 people over half of which worked in small workshops producing cloth or wool, at a time when most of Europe still worked on the land. This made it a centre for art and music, like 1960s Greenwich Village. But artists were dependent on commissions from the ruling families, in particular the ruling Medici, who modestly called himself Lorenzo the Magnificent. Leonardo impressed Lorenzo the Magnificent when one of his sketches attracted a crowd for two days. And from then on, his novelty was the scientific method with which he approached his art. He decided that pre-Renaissance art was flawed because it failed to portray images in accordance with the way the human eye receives them. Leonardo recognised that the eye perceives a total picture, that at any one time we see all that's before us, although we don't see each object equally. So to recreate the image seen by the natural eye, a painter has to have a mathematical understanding of perspective. Before painting a field, he would study the botany of the flowers in minute detail, and a contemporary called Giovanni Battista Giraldi wrote... When Leonardo wished to paint a figure, he first considered the social standing, whether troubled or serene, irate or quiet. Then he went to places where he knew that kind of person assembled and observed their faces, manners and gestures, and repeated this procedure many times. In other words, he was a method painter. His mathematical approach even extended to his system for calculating the cost of his work. The bill for decorating a palace hall read... Outlay for blue, gold and other colours, one and a half lira. 24 pictures of Roman history, 14 lira each. Philosophers, 10 lira. Just like a builder. That's probably how the Mona Lisa ended up like that. He went, ooh, I'm in with a whole laugh. You're looking at 15 lira plus your labour. Then you've got your teeth, you see. I'll tell you what I do. For 12, I'll do you a faint grin. Make it good, you'll never know the difference. And he was like a builder in another respect, in that he never seems to finish. In his mid-twenties, he got his first independent commission that's recorded to sculpt an altarpiece in the chapel of St Bernard. He received a first payment, but Leonardo never did the work. He was contracted to deliver another altarpiece for the Chapel of the Conception in Milan, but he never did it, which led to the church taking out a legal action which wasn't resolved for 25 years. The monks of San Donato Escapeto paid him to do another altarpiece, giving him 30 months to complete it. After seven months, he stopped work on it and never touched it again. Usually he did start projects, it's just that he didn't finish them. For example, the adoration of the kings is extraordinarily complicated with dozens of characters and galloping horses displaying complex expressions and all mapped out according to his laws of mathematics and perspective. To someone like me, who's utterly useless at art, all this technical perfection seems amazing because I'm staggered by anybody who can draw at all. 
In adoration of the kings, next to the Virgin Mary, and equal to her in size at least, is a philosopher, giving human ideas a status they never could have held in pre-Renaissance times. The only flaw is that many of the characters, including the Virgin herself and the baby, are, as they say in the art world, left in sketch form. Or to a layman like myself, God, he never got round to colouring them bits in. <laughs> there was another side to the atmosphere in the city-states that affected Leonardo's career, which was the constant threat of war. Florence had overrun Pisa, Milan was threatened by the French and Spanish, both cities were in conflict with Venice and everybody feared Rome. Leonardo knew the sforzas of Milan were threatened on all sides, so he offered his services as an artist who could double as a military engineer. But the sforzas may also have been keen to employ him because he was reputed to be one of the finest players of the lute across the city. Not only that, but Leonardo made his own lute out of silver in the shape of a horse's skull. So he was the world's first heavy metal lute player. According to the 16th century writer Vasari, he surpassed all the musicians who had assembled to perform and so charmed the Duke by his varied gifts that the nobleman delighted beyond measure. Leonardo also impressed Francesco Sforza with his plans to build a huge bronze statue of his horse. He spent several days wandering around fields, studying horses, but kept getting distracted. Yeah, come on, get out, get your ass again. Over a period of 15 years. One of his projects that took him away from the horse was his design of possibly the world's first ever revolving stage for the theatre. And at one point, he was commissioned to make something extraordinary to celebrate a visit from the King of France. Not only that, Leonardo would buy birds in the market at Milan and then take them home, open the cage and let them fly off. He wasn't just being soppy about birds, he saw them as creatures who could teach humans about science by doing naturally what we strive to do artificially. If he'd only been liberating them, he could have let them go in the market. For the same reason, he imprisoned flies so that he could study the way they fly to see if he could work out how humans could as well. But he had to interrupt his studies on flight to get back to building the Sforza's giant horse. The trouble was he was then commissioned to paint the Last Supper on a monastery wall. I'll do it. And he clearly became dedicated to it, as his method was described by a friend, Bandello. Many a time I have seen Leonardo work on the Last Supper from sunrise till darkness, never eating or drinking. Then three or four days would pass without his touching the work, yet each day he would spend several hours examining it. The cynic might say this was just laziness, as if he was being like a builder going... <sighs> That Judas is going to have to come out. But the reason he was so obsessed with this painting was that, as well as his normal concern for mathematical perfection, for him it represented the whole meaning of the Renaissance. For a while, Leonardo dedicated himself to creating a whole new approach to designing towns. On the other hand, he'd been paid to sculpt this bloody horse. He did build a clay model of the design, but then he got distracted again by his scientific studies. He read the original scientific writings of the ancients and he became obsessed with analysing motion, convinced that every movement could be explained mathematically. 150 years before Isaac Newton, he wrote... It is not possible to describe the movement of water unless one defines gravitation. Even more visionary were his theories on sound. 400 years before Marconi, he wrote... Just as the stone thrown into the water becomes the centre and cause of various circles, the sound made in the air spreads out in circles. The amazing thing about Leonardo's notebooks is that they covered every area of science. A hundred years before Galileo, he insisted the sun didn't move and therefore the Earth wasn't the centre of the universe. And he used his knowledge of perspective to figure out that each star was a distant sun, as vast and as powerful as our own. Leonardo's view of the universe was that every part of it was linked and affected every other part, so no one part could be studied in isolation. The scientist had to be an artist, the artist a geologist and so on. If he'd met Stephen Hawking, he'd have said, you're not a proper scientist, you can't play the lute. And there's the clue as to why he couldn't...